So yeah, now it's recording. So we have today Katarina Blain. She will speak uh, about calibration of uh, question answering models. And she's doing a, her PhD at UCI, University of California, Irvine. Please, Katarina, now, yes, you can start. Hi, thank you so much for having, he, having me here. Um, let me share my slides. Can, can you see them? Yes. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, so I will um, begin uh, the presentation. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, today, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about uh, a problem that exists currently uh, in that concerns generative question answering models, as, as well as to uh, emphasize some of the challenges um, that people have been addressing or that we have to take into account when we are considering the calibration of these uh, textual based uh, systems. And I will also mention, briefly mention some of the uh, most um, uh, relevant state of the art that exists nowadays with respect to these um, generative question answering models. So regarding the agenda for today, uh, it's no surprise that I will try to convince you why this is a problem and why I am focusing on generative question answering models. I, as I said, I will briefly mention some of the challenges in calibration for NLP, namely the exponential cardinality, the length of the sequences, and as well as other challenges. I will mention the, some of the recent work and I will end with some concluding remarks, some takeaway messages. And I will uh, state whether this is solved or not. So question answering systems, I'm not sure how familiar you all are. So I will just uh, briefly go over this uh, type of systems, question answering systems for this talk, we will focus on a particular subset of these systems, which assume that the, the model will be fed a context, which is a set of answers that aims to support um, the question. So when the model is generating the answer, it can look for support in this context. It will also receive the question, of course, and then it will, based, based on these two pieces of information, it, it's supposed to generate some answer. In this case, it's just a single token, but it might be a sentence. And typically, these systems, uh, or the systems I'll be covering here today, the, 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 the answer stops when we see the first end of sequence token, which is a special token that signals that we should end the generation at this point. Um, regarding generative question answering, how do we compute its probabilities? So it's called generative question answering in, because we are uh, essentially computing the model's probabilities in an autoregressive fashion. And because of this, we can continue, continue to generate tokens conditioned on the previous tokens and also on the context and the question. And this is uh, basically we are iterating in an autoregressive fashion. And what exactly we mean by this model probability? We can think of this as conditioning on some text. In this case, X will be the context and the question as we've seen before. And then condition on that information, our model, our generative model has an implicit conditional distribution over all possible token sequences that begin with a start of sequence token in this image pictured as SOS. And they end, these sequences end with the end of sequence token. Um, and so we are considering all the possible sets of sequences that have a start of sequence token, a sequence of tokens, and end of sequence. So if we were to sample many sequences from this conditional distribution of our model, uh, the model probability for any particular sequence will reflect how likely it is that this particular sequence will be sampled. Um, in some sense, you can think of it as a reflection of how likely a sequence is under this model's conditional distribution. And the question of interest in this context and for this talk is how, to what extent do these model probabilities for, for these sequences correlate with how likely these sequences are to be the correct answer? And we will see that it's not a trivial, it's not a trivial uh, relationship even so we, in, in question answering, we will also see that even what it means to be correct might be a bit uh, fuzzy sometimes. Okay. Um, 
yeah and why why am i here at 1 p.m uh talking to you about generative question answering models and why we should care well recently we've been entering in uh, an era where we are seeking for more uh, for larger language models, for approaches that are more flexible, that we can uh, use, train in multiple tasks, and then they will have high performance in down, downstream tasks without, sometimes not, we don't even have to fine tune it further. So that's precisely one of the key uh, advantages of generative question answering models. They are very flexible, they can be applicable to many tasks without the need for more fine tuning. And at, at sometimes it's even just a matter of just having a different format, just framing your problem, your different task as a question answering, and those models will immediately uh, uh, be able to, to give some, some answers. And sometimes they are very good. And they are also, yeah, they are very good. They have a high performance. In some cases, they achieved state-of-the-art performance. And as a result, they also are, um, applicable to a wide range of tasks, um, namely dialogue or chatbots, or even for information retrieval, with the potential to be applied to different uh, uh, domains, such as healthcare uh, or criminal justice. And as you can probably uh, realize, if we are going, especially if we are going to deploy this for high domain, uh, application, uh, high risk applications, it becomes even more important to guarantee that there, there exists this correlation between model scores and some notion of correctness and that our users are aware of the, what exactly the correctness measure is and whether the models are good or not. And going into the problem itself, what happens is even though these models are uh, remarkably impressive in terms of performance. It's often uh, the case that they are wrong and overconfident in many of in many examples that human uh, humans would deem this is completely wrong. And um, in this case, we have two examples of the question answering. Uh, I omitted the context for brevity and for simplicity of the slides, otherwise they would be very verbose. And in this case, what I want to emphasize is that the model is clearly wrong in the answers that is given, is giving, and it's super confident. So someone that didn't know anything about the formation of an asymmetrical pattern of different terraces would probably believe this uh, that verso would be a valid answer when it's not the case. And so the talk today is more about how can we quantify and how can we try to uh, counteract this, this type of behavior from the model? And one way to um, measure and quantify this um, behavior, this how wrong and how overconfident the models are, is through reliability diagrams. And yeah, in theory, if we have enough data and appropriate model, we, it's uh, statistically proven that minimizing or finding a minimum of the log loss or the squared error converges to the true conditional posterior distribution. And one way to see that visually is through this liability diagram where we have on the x-axis the model's probability for the generated sequence or the confidence. On, on the y-axis, we plot some uh, measure of accuracy, the empirical accuracy in our data. And a, a well-calibrated model would ideally have or lie um, along this diagonal, right? And because that would mean that for uh, when the model's probability is 0 0.8, the actual accuracy is also 0 0.8, which is good. It's what we want. And in, oftentimes you'll see in papers, if you start reading into this uh, calibration literature, you'll see uh, what's called the expected calibration error, which is a way of uh, condensing the information in, in this plot. And essentially, you can think of binning, um, binning uh, the scale from zero to one in M bins, and then plotting the, uh, or computing the difference um, between the average accuracy in each bin and the average confidence in each bin, and weighting by the number of points in each, or the, the number of examples in each bin. And this is called ECEs, 
fairly used in, in, in this type of works. Just so that we are more familiar with these kind of plots, there's there are different ways to represent them. Um, but the key idea that we, we should um, take from this is that if we have the lines above this diagonal line, then the model is underconfident. Whereas if it's below the diagonal line, it's going to be overconfident. And in this case, we can see that in this case, it's overconfident because the model is giving is assigning a, a confidence value of 0 0.8, but in reality, its true accuracy would be 0 0.6. Okay, going back to our setting now, I said that uh, generative question answering models are wrong and overconfident, and I'm not the only one uh, saying that. So there's work where we have this, again, these are also a different way of seeing the same plots we've seen before, where the height of the bars represent the, the points that we had on the previous plot. So in this case, this is over this model, uh, a state of the art model T5 um, is overconfident for in this regime and underconfident in this regime. And it, it has been shown that these models are not well calibrated. Um, and therefore, it comes to the conclusion that probably uh, probability estimates cannot be used uh, to discern when a language model knows the answer to particular questions. So if we were, when, when one application of this system that we would like is to be able to threshold based on, on the confidence score and abstain from giving an answer, a wrong answer to the user. But since these probability estimates are not quite calibrated, it becomes a bit difficult to, to, to know uh, with confidence if the, the model knows or not this, the, the answers. Oh, and in this case, the unified QA, uh, for who's not familiar, is um, a, a fine-tuned uh, T5 model in a bunch of question answering systems. And we can see that it's a bit better calibrated, but still overconfidence in the high regime. Um, even if the, for example, I, I, I've done some experiments earlier in this year, and I, I found that in some cases, for example, large uh, unified QA T5 small was calibrated in domain in some cases uh, for some in domain data sets. In this case, squad was one of the data sets used to train unified QA, so it's considered in domain. And uh, although the this is a fairly, I would say, calibrated model. We can always get better, but I would say that comparing to what we've seen previously with T5, it's fairly well calibrated. And what we noticed uh, consistently is that these models are severely uh, miscalibrated in out of the main data set. So in this, on the right hand side, we have a different data set that wasn't used for training unified QA. And you can see that it's easy it's also pretty high and the model is overconfident throughout all the, all the distribution. So this is also a problem. We would like the models to give uh, a bit more calibrated scores so that we can use that setting of threshold based on, on the scores as well. Yeah, and so the goal of calibration is how can we go from, from the left side where we have uncalibrated probability estimates to the right hand side uh, where we have a bit more uh, well-behaved model and where there's this correlation between accuracy and the confidence. Um, is, is there any questions so far before going deeper? I don't think so. I think everything was pretty clear so far. So go ahead, um, Katrina. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, I'll, I'll just mention the challenges and, uh, that are usually, that we can usually think about. It doesn't mean that there, there aren't more. These are just the, a few of them that I, I would like to emphasize in this presentation. Um, and in particular, I would like to contrast the, the differences between traditional machine learning and where there's a lot of work in this area. And also in, to some extent, uh, image classification also has a, a 
a lot of, of work done in that area uh, against the NLP research, which has, um, has seen less work and yeah, we'll go over it. So one of the key differences is the, the output space cardinality or the cardinality of the output space. In traditional ML, we often have K, class, K classes or K classification um, problems. And in most cases, I would say it's binary. And whereas in NLP, we often have an exponentials output space. And I, yeah, I put here, assuming we have a fixed, um, in, in, in practice, because I mentioned in the beginning, when we are generating answers or when we have this generative setting, we are, we might have the end of sequence. So technically, if we don't restrict the length of the sequence, we would have an infinite space. But in general, people just um, add uh, a, a maximum length constraint so that we have a bound. And if there's a maximum of, so the, the complexity is at most, the upper bound is at most the, uh, the size of the vocabulary to the power of uh, T, which is the sequence length. But in general, it will be lower because we, we are not always generating this maximum sequence length, we hope. <laughs> um, yeah. The second challenge is what uh, the probabilities uh, represent. So in machine learning, typically the probabilities represent the probability of a single class. Whereas in NLP, we have the probability of the sequence being generated by the model. And in some cases, um, we will see that um, some of the work deem the, the direct uh, probabilities that come out of the language model, as we've seen earlier in these slides, they deem that this is not enough and it's not a good measure to, to have calibration. Then we have a big problem in my opinion, which is the correctness. What does it mean to be correct? And this is what has made me so confused for the past few months. So in machine learning, we have typically, we know what is a correct class, but in NLP, there are a whole branch, a whole new set of dimensions. We have semantic correctness. We can have two answers, for example, uh, in question answering, like we can have two answers that are semantically equivalent. And as far as I know, there the existing metrics are not good enough to capture that. We can have syntactic correctness. We can have two, uh, two answers and one of them being partially correct or one of them adds more information than the other. And so it's also correct, but the current models don't reflect that. And, and so this is a big, uh, a big difference in my opinion in NLP. And it also, so I would argue that to solve also calibration, we should also try to see if we can get better metrics for, for NLP to capture these this, uh, no, different notions, especially if we are uh, deploying these systems uh, to, to, be interact, to, be, to interact with users. And yeah, and then there are other challenges. Um, in NLP, we often have skewed distributions or some frequency bias. There's the length of the answers, um, the position bias. In some cases, we've seen that some models take some cues based on the position of, of where the answer is located in the context. And, and so there are a, a, a whole new set of challenges that we, we, we can think of uh, when trying to, to address calibration. And yeah, this, this concludes the first part of the talk. So before proceeding to the next part, if someone has any question or comment or any different perspective of this topic that you would like to share, I'd be happy to hear. I think that this problem finds some uh, intersections with, uh, for instance, with summarization, which is a problem in which I've been working on. Uh, where we have uh, also hallucinations in the summary, so external data that was not in the source document, so which is not factually consistent. And oftentimes the model uh, has high confidence on, on that uh, hallucination as well. So I'm, I'm pretty uh, curious to see how you address this in, in terms of, of question answering models, because probably some, some ideas can be uh, shared for, for the two domains. So. Uh, 
just to give some context that this problem is not uh, does not happen only in, in question answering, but but in other uh, domains as well and in other problems as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's also actually some work in a machine translation as well. Yes, in machine yeah. translation. Yes, yeah. also. Okay, I think I, I'll go, I'll move forward then. Um, yeah, so regarding different uh, research um, lines that I found uh, regarding uh, the calibration of question answering models, I mainly divided them in three sub topics or sub line or three different lines. The first one is to tack, tackle the problem of instead of, or tries to narrow down the output space to some manageable uh, and manageable um, sets. And in this case, it's essentially about trying to just focus on the relevant set instead of trying to give a confident or reliable confidence measures for with respect to the whole set, just try to use information about your problem. So if you have a multiple choice question, in this case, uh, question, uh, yeah, if you have a multiple choice question, instead of trying to give calibrated, uh, um, calibrated um, uh, scores for considering the whole output space, just focus on this candidate answer, which, and so you are going to normalize and give the confidence measures you're going to calibrate with respect to all the all the, the answers that lie in your set of interests, um, which is, it is called often in the literature as event of interest sets. Um, the second approach is focused on trying to frame an external task to distinguish or to tell how likely the model is to be correct. So in this case, we would take the answer generated by or picked by the model as well as the the reference label, and then we would formulate a binary classification task whose goal is to say, given this generated answer and this original answer, is, is, is it correct? And we will see which kind of features we can use to, to train these kind of models. Uh, we can use information about the inputs, the data, or about the model, internal state of the model, about its confidence, um, and we'll see that uh, shortly. The third uh, research line is to learn to produce a calibrated probability. So as I was always saying is like uh, considering conditioning on this event of interest or on these candidate answers that you consider. So a smaller output space size, you try to update your model parameters to instead focus on this uh, kind of distribution rather than the just modeling uh, text. And there are uh, uh, several works uh, that tackle different aspects or uh, throughout the time I've tackled different aspects. Today, I will mostly focus on one of these works um, and briefly mention the others um, because I think this work is one of the most recent ones and it covers all the three different research areas. Um, and so without further ado, let's go. So this work by uh, Jung et al, published in ACL 2021, it's for six different approaches to calibration. And in general, these are going to reflect the state of the art that I found in all the other papers. And because they had some kind of comparison between them, I, I thought it would be the most interesting to present here. Um, the first approach is, as I said, to reduce the space of outputs to the relevant candidates. And maybe before I, I, I jump into the state of the art, I just want to give a disclaimer. Uh, in these question answering systems, there are different types of question answering. We have multiple choice, which is how we, we the examples we've seen so far is multiple choice. There's what's called a single span or extractive setting. We, whose goal is to, given a context and the question, generate an answer that we know it's in the, in the context. And there's one that is called abstractive or freeform, 
where we are not limited to generating a span that is in the context, we can generate a more complex and like compose different spans and it's a bit more uh, abstract or free, free of form. But uh, I just want to tell you that uh, there's not much work. I didn't find any work on abstractive or free form and all these works I found either focused on multiple choice or being in the extractive setting. And now I'll be talking mostly about multiple choice question answering, but still following the generative approach. So we are generating, we are taking into account the probabilities given by the generative or the autoregressive model I, I introduced in the beginning. Okay, um, so going into this, uh, this work, it explores six different approaches. The first one, as I said, is to reduce the space, the output space to just the relevant candidates uh, denoted I of X. And in this case, in the multiple choice setting, it's essentially considering the four different candidate choices. Um, and then when you are outputting your model probabilities, you just normalize over all this, um, all, over all the, the, the probabilities in your candidate set. Um, However, um, well, actually, let me just say something else. They also have the same in this paper. They also propose uh, a similar um, a similar approach or a similar um, yeah a similar approach to extractive settings, where so you can think of that in extractive settings, a naive way of considering the this candidate uh, this set of can relevant candidates would be just to consider all possible. Uh, spans or all possible expressions in the context, but that would be computationally a bit uh, too much. And so what they do is they just, they have some heuristic way of, of determining the candidate sets. They first generate the tokens um, and then they, they generate the first token distribution under our model. They only consider the tokens that appear in the context and then they generate are sequences up to length uh, k, and they pick the top um, the top k uh, sequences um, that occur in the context themselves, and they keep those as the as the candidates, the relevant candidates. So they found a way, it's an heuristic way of trying to uh, narrow down a bit more the the space for the extractive setting as well, and then the the approach for Getting the scores would be the same as this one. They have this set i x um, i of x, and and so they just normalize the probabilities over the all the candidates in this set. Um, however, there's a problem because um, just naively doing this 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 um, following this approach is not accounting for the fact that. Um, there might be different ways of saying the same thing. So this is called, it's a property of models, language modeling called surface form competition, where we have different ways of saying the same thing. And what might happen is that, for example, weird pull bath is a bit weird uh, term, it's not as frequent, and there are different ways to say uh, the same thing or to answer to the same question, but they were not enumerated in the candidates. And so in some cases, what might happen is that the most mass probability is being given to these two options. And this is lowering down um, in some sense, the, the, the actual probability that you give to the Whirlpool bath. And in some cases, it might be even enough to make one of the other options stand out as a, the answer because it achieves better, um, better calibration, a better um, higher probability estimates. And so one way that they propose to tackle this is through paraphrasing, where the goal is to use some uh, paraphrasing system and to get different ways of saying the same thing. And what they do is now they enlarge in some sense the probability estimates of each specific candidate by summing over all the probabilities given to each of the paraphrased versions. And the remaining uh, framework um, is the same. So we, we, we still pick the map prediction using this type of um, 
this, this updated model probabilities. And we also, if we want to give a notion of, of confidence, we are still normalizing over the set of candidate answers where now the probability is always considering this, this paraphrased enlarged uh, probability estimates. Naturally, this is also tied to a paraphrasing model, which was trying in some specific distributions. And you are only as good as the paraphrasing model you use. Um, and there, are, there has been other work also in multiple choice where they try to, they claim that the direct probability is not an adequate uh, zero shot function of the score. And so they, they propose to reweight the, the scores based on some task specific string that, that makes it, um, that tries to accommodate some of these uh, different surface forms and is, is going to reweight based on how likely, for example, in an example, uh, it was 3 a.m. Um, they try to reweight it, how much likely the hypothesis it was 3 a.m. becomes given the premise that the bar closed because, and it was 3 a.m. So they try to do this kind of reasoning uh, using uh, uh, pointwise mutual information. I, yeah. And that, that has the advantage that you are not tied to a, a different model. Um, and, but it's only applicable to, to, um, to multiple choice. So there are trade-offs. A third, a third approach to calibration is the fine tuning, um, where they, the difference here essentially is, this is a, so we now have some updated model probabilities or not model probability, sorry, um, model confidence. And we want our model to output this model confidence. So a, a possible approach is to just fine tune the model to learn these, um, these confidence measures. And so that's what they propose here using these two different uh, um, objective functions where the main difference is that your, the scores you're using um, will be normalized over, you are enforcing an, a normalized score over the set of candidate answers instead of just considering the language model probability by default. And so this is going to update the model parameters and hopefully it will give you a, a better result. Um, and for the case of margin base, they essentially propose it because there has been some work in uh, traditional machine learning uh, with respect to uh, distance-based classifiers, for example, SVM, where they say that it's, they are good. Um, we are actually uh, able to get very good calibrated models, SVM models after applying some other transformation on top, for example, plot scaling. And so they decided to try this as well, where they are essentially trying to maximize the distance up to some threshold from the correct answer to all the other answers in the candidate list. Just for sake of clarity, as here means uh, is the logic of the corresponding output where they omitted the x, the condition on x for simplicity. But it should be like the, the log probabilities of the language model of y given x. A different type of, uh, of calibration approach is temperature-based scaling. Uh, here, in this case, we don't update the language model uh, parameters themselves. It relies only on the confidence um, measure, and it's not going to change their ranking. It only adjusts the magnitude of their values. Um, so it, uh, it, it consists of adding this parameter here on the last softmax. And here, the softmax is applied over the set of candidate answers that you have. So uh, a value of zero here will basically attribute the, the, the most probability mass to the most likely candidate um, in your uh, candidate set, whereas uh, a value of tau 
tending to the infinite, a very large number will make it uh, the distribution to become more uniform. The, the fifth approach that they apply, and this is by far the, the one I've seen most work on in the literature is to create an external task to determine how likely is the model to be correct. And going into a bit more detail in what I mean by this. So we have our question answering system, typically with the uncalibrated scores, we have the context, the question, the language model, it generates a, an answer. And this task of uh, creating an, ex an external task is oftentimes called also selective prediction. Um, and the goal is to basically frame a different uh, classification task where we are going to use, we are going to compare the predicted answer with the reference to produce the labels. And then we use some information about the language model and the input itself, uh, which I denote here with phi. And we feed this to these uh, machine learning models or a different um, a system, a more complex system. And, and, and it's supposed to, to, to determine if, if, the, if this uh, answer, if these, are, if these match, if, if we are getting a right prediction or not. And in general, this um, yields a, a better calibration, calibrated scores, even in out of domain, it has been shown that it has promising, um, promising results as well. So, yeah. And it's called selective prediction, just also to give a bit of more context because it's about select using this mechanisms, mechanism to select which predictions to return to the user or not. And so we abstain when it's below a given threshold. And, and most works in the, so in this case in this work of Jian et al, they use different different uh, features. The features are the whole coffee confidence, the normalized probabilities. They also capture some uh, measure of uncertainty of the model by measuring the entropy uh, of the distribution of your candidate set. They also try to ac account for some. Uh, distribution shift by measuring the language, the language model perplexity of the inputs. And they also have some other input statistics like the length of the input or the output uh, to try to also be a bit more sensitive to how long is this, uh, are the questions or the context or the generated answer and try to use that information somehow. And then, um, in this work, they use XGBoost, uh, XGBoost as the machine learning model to just learn this binary classification. And I guess for for completeness of this of this talk, I I should say that most works uh, essentially just have some variation of 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 the type of features they use or the the models that they use here on that side. For example, other features that I've seen using is also, for example, a measure of uncertainty of the model is to use dropouts and generate a bunch of uh, samples and then try to measure the, the, basically they use MC dropout, which is applied at inference time by applying dropouts at inference in your network. And this will generate a different conditional distribution. And then in the end, they just take the average or the variance or everything um, and they feed to the model and give it as, a, as a, a measure of uncertainty of the model as well. I've also seen some people uh, providing uh, other than just the, the, top, uh, the top confidence to also provide like the margin. So how far you are, this, this how confidence, how far it is from the second to best uh, confidence value. And it's also a measure of how I guess how good or how certain you are about your, your probability estimates. Um, I've also seen some other people, sorry, I'm just trying to remember all the, all, all the people did. Sometimes they also use some uh, embedded representation of the input. So they, they take the, the context and the question, they pass it through the model, and then in the end they get the embeddings in the, 
to get like a condensed representation of the input and then they also feed to these to these other models and yeah completely different approach as well has been so there are there are many works uh, other works have tried to use as well as inputs uh, feature attribution so explanations and they show it helps uh, I can point you to the paper if you're interested I'm not going to cover it here today um, yeah and other work has also uh, considered for example instead of uh, they try to formulate the question answering task as a different NLP problem for example NLI natural language inference where they try to formulate it as a a problem where you are giving an hypothesis and the premise and then you have to say if the the uh, uh, hypothesis is entailed or not by the premise i think it, it, it's like uh, this and um yeah they show it also improves and they are able to do a bit better job but you also are conditioned on how well your pipeline that allows you to go from question answering to nli is so there are different trade-offs i don't think this is, uh, there is a single uh, strategy that solves all these problems. I just mentioning some of the works that have been done here. And the final uh, approach that they consider here is data augmentation. And this was largely motivated by the previous findings that uh, factual predictions could be improved if more context was provided. And so they, basically retrieve the most relevant Wikipedia article using some uh, retrieval systems. And they append the first paragraph of that article to the, to the input, to the context. Um, and they, they are hoping that this will help uh, getting a better and improve the confidence estimation of the language models. And just, uh, as a side note, these, the fourth and fifth approach are um, also called in the literature as post-op methods because they are applied after the model, so they are not updating the model itself. Um, regarding the results, I'm almost done. Um, yeah, they, they show that um, large language models achieve high performance but are not well calibrated. Um, and then they have they have a, a lot of experiments with, which was nice, and in terms of multiple choice question answering, this was the setting where we had most uh, promising results, and in particular fine tuning methods and post hoc so the temperature based scaling and the uh, the external task method were able to improve calibration with minimal accuracy drop. Um, the best fine-tuning method for multiple choice was the margin-based, um, and the, for post-hoc, the best one was temperature scaling. And one thing I should notice as well is that in general, temperature scaling and, and feature-based methods or external tasks, the, the selective prediction methods, are usually amongst the best in terms of out-of-domain calibration. They achieve the best results as well although they don't have that clear explicit uh, result in this paper um, and the best performing method in their paper for the multiple choice question answering was margin of, which was a combination of different methods um, when considering the extractive question answering um, paraphrasing didn't help in this setting uh, it did for question a multiple choice and um, the XG boost, so the, this external selective prediction kind of uh, method was the best postdoc method. And also for fine tuning, the best one was softmax. Um, yeah, in, in terms of general conclusions, uh, the postdoc calibration methods, as I said, are seem to be the ones that retrieve better, better results. Um, Paraphrasing and data augmentation were helpful for the multiple choice, but not for extractive question answering tasks. Maybe uh, um, I'm assuming, or I think they also mentioned something like this in the paper, but uh, the length of the answers uh, that are in your candidate sets might also have an impact on that and on the quality of your paraphrasing. 
um, calibration methods seem to be complementary since the combination of different methods provided the best improvement. And um, they report some slight improvements in calibration for out of the mind as well. And they also mentioned that, uh, although I don't think this is like a standard yet, but uh, larger language models uh, achieve higher accuracy and better calibration performance than smaller ones. Um, yeah, in some experiments I did, this was not the case, but maybe I need more experiments. Um, yeah, and so just to wrap up, um, what we didn't cover today was uh, the other papers that I was mentioning, usefulness of explanation. There's some work by Greg Duchet where they explore how explanations are useful for um, improving confidence estimates. Um, also, something that is used, I've seen being used in a lot in machine translation calibration literature is label smoothing, and it has been shown to help, but I, I haven't seen that much done in question answering. Also, the uh, natural language inference assisted systems that I was telling you uh, that I briefly mentioned, uh, we also didn't cover that today. I can, I can follow up with the papers. We also didn't cover the definitions of correctness. So every paper or every result I've shown is considering the exact match. So exact whether the string, um, the predicted string is exactly the same as the reference or the golden truth. And um, we could have different ways of measuring correctness. Um, calibration for abstractive or freeform question answering. So when we are not limited to some specific substring in the text and the model is actually to do some work in trying to put pieces together um, and generate a, a plausible answer. Also, I didn't mention calibration for open domain question answering when there's no context. Uh, so I always assume there's context and it, most open domain question answering contexts can default to one of these, uh, of these uh, settings that we talked today. Um, up to the point that you have to have a retriever to find the relevant set of documents. Um, and there's also some work trying to get the calibration between the retriever and, the, and the, this, the header part, which is the one that assuming a context and the question tries to give a calibrated score. And I also didn't go too deep on calibration for out of domain uh, settings. Yeah, in terms of conclusions, uh, I guess just I'm going to say it one more time to try to convince you. Generative question answering are being increasingly sought for their flexibility and state of the art performance. Um, but they have been shown to be wrong and overconfident in many cases, which is somewhat worrying. And um, combining multiple calibration techniques may lead to, to, to better calibration in the end. Um, and uh, yeah, and most work that we've seen so far is just focused on multiple choice and extract extractive uh, tasks or single span tasks. And there's not that much progress in the extractive setting and there's no research as far as I could tell in abstractive question answering. So this free form uh, setting. And I think I'm gonna conclude the presentation here. Thank you so much. I hope you liked or learned something Thank you, Katarina. Uh, we have some time for questions. You can uh, either raise your hand and, and ask them directly, or you can ask them through the chat. So feel free to, to ask uh, in the way you prefer. So someone has raised hand, Simão Novaes. Simão, please. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation, Katarina. I think the topic is very interesting. On both ends, um, you know, calibration, uh, I've been looking at it recently for the purpose of prognosis modeling, and uh, it, and, uh, it seems that um, it would be useful to have a, a calibrated model so as to abstain from a set of a multi-level prediction, so as to not to induce the doctors in error, so abstain from uncertain predictions or uh, parts of the prediction. I think the calibration is very important in that. And even in Q&A, um, I think it could have you know, potential for um, uh, on the education side of things. I think if you can uh, you know, parse a large uh, uh, academic uh, text 
in in any form and um, produce you know questions and answers that could be a, a good uh, way of automating learning materials or something like that um so just to give that introduction and so a question i have um is more regarding the temperature scaling method you mentioned um uh, because I, i've also looked at it a, a little bit before and uh and, and yeah it seems like in general it's 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 a method that works very well and it's very easy to implement when we want to calibrate any model we have you know for you know for example in a multi-classification problem um I just have like a, a, a couple of questions about the temperature scaling, which is, um, I don't know if you can help with that, which is, so we can start with an already trained model, right? So it's trained on a particular training set, and then you can optimize that parameter T later. So where, where does it make sense to optimize it? In, in what sets of data does it make sense to optimize it? Do we go back to the training set? Will that generalize, or should we have a, an outside, you know, a validation set just to optimize the T per meter in, temp in temperature scaling. I'm not sure how how we should go about that. I don't know if you have any insights. Yeah, in, uh, thanks for the question and, and for your feedback. Um, in general, uh, these, these temperature scaling techniques are usually done in a validation set so that you don't overfeed too much to the training. Mm, that's okay. it. Okay, I see. So, okay, okay. And then, so if we do a validation set for that, for the T per meter, would we need like another validation just to see if it um, generalizes somewhat uh, um, on an unseen part of the data? Like, so, yeah. I, I think if you want to guarantee that you're not overfitting any part of your pipeline, a, a good uh, rule of thumb would be to, if you have enough data to just have a separate okay. validation set. One of the, the I guess, um, I forgot the word, sorry. One of the, the things that people usually say that this method is not a, that good about is that it requires a, a validation set. Mm. So you wow. need to have some uh, notion of what distribution you want to tune to these mm -hmm. methods to. So there's also been some work where they try to see if they can get better without having to have this, or to explore other methods without having to have this access to uh, uh, development sets. Okay. Of the that, you're interested in. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And do you happen to know, like, um, I read a paper, maybe I need to read it again a few more times. Um, it's maybe it's a specific question, but what are we like optimizing for when we train the T per meter? Like, um, so we know we want to to turn the, the maximum soft max value into a more real probability of correctness. So mm -hmm. what like the, the loss, uh, what yeah. does the loss look like? In, in this case, I've seen people using the negative log like likelihood yeah. in the left set. And using in this case, I guess you can also combine it with the norm. I'm going to call it normalized normalized probabilities over your candidate set. Mm. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it's it has been a question for me. Why does the negative log likelihood like help uh, the parameter t bring the maximum soft marks exactly to the correctness uh, but maybe uh, i should check in and should check it um, better uh, afterwards after this feel free uh, to to also follow up with me if you want uh, yeah yeah thank you very much yeah I, 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 I think one of the main differences here is that they are using uh, that normalized probabilities to okay okay i need to see that enforce it and I think um, that's it. Yeah, uh, just the comments, uh, as you said, about um, you know the auto distribution, these calibration methods, the, the they stop working. Yeah, it's very interesting how that happens. And uh, and uh, uh, I was actually wondering if you had looked into any methods, any calibration method that happened to work a little bit well on auto distribution data, but I also couldn't find. 
And uh, but at least there's a, a subfield that focuses just on um, of machine learning that focuses just on identifying out this distribution data through other ways other than calibration. So I don't but I've know. seen I've seen in practices in the papers I've read um, is that the fit, uh, so they call it different names they call it feature based or that the one where we fit a, a different task we create this external task these models I've seen doing somewhat well in in out of domain distribution and but in some cases uh, the literature if you go and read some of the papers sometimes they don't necessarily target this strict notion of calibration mm -hmm. using the reliability diagrams and ECE but instead they focus on getting the right um, um, the right points further ahead so they're not focused in calibration in the absolute sense where the score is actually uh, uh, aligned with the probability of that sentence being correct, but rather whether, like, if I'm go, I'm assuming I have some distribution that spans some range, and if I threshold it at this specific range, am, do I get all the correct predictions on top of that threshold? Do I, am I eliminating all the, the 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 wrong answers? And so you'll often see in that literature some plots which are the F1 score over the coverage, which is the coverage is basically how as you go over, like as you threshold different, or you consider different yeah. portions of your data set, how good is your F1 score on average? Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I, I've seen some of that too, and yeah. Mm -hmm. And thank you. That that's all. Uh, I think Juan Gant has a question as well. So Juan, uh, yeah. Can ask uh, you? Thank you, Katerina, for your talk. Uh, you talked about um, stochastic forward passes to obtain the uncertainty, such as using Monte Carlo dropout. I'm curious if you know more details about the implementation. I'm asking this because we are talking about generative uh, question answering. So we are generating the text and uh, methods like Monte Carlo dropout are typically applied on a forward pass. Since we are doing generation, we are doing multiple forward passes because it's autoregressive. How is the uncertainty collected? Do they do the, the greedy search and collect the uncertainty at each forward pass and then they average it? Do they do beam search and, I don't know, prune, prune some branches based on uncertainty? Um, yeah, that's a great question, Joel. Uh, they didn't give that much information in the paper and I confess I didn't look into the code. Um, my idea from what I've read, but I, I can go, I can follow up with you later uh, as well about mm -hmm. that. My idea was that they were using the greedy decoding pass and they were collecting the probabilities for this okay, that makes sense. answers and then they average in the end or yeah. compute the, the variance. But I, I can look into that and get back to mm -hmm. you. I, I would be curious to know the performance when um, we combine the uh, uncertainty uh, detection uh, traits of Monte Carlo dropout with beam search so we could like prune mm. branches in advance uh, but I don't know if anyone has yeah. uh, looked into that as far as I, I I am familiar with no one has looked into that and also most works have only considered greedy decoding which is also something to consider yeah thank you uh, I have a question as well, Katarina. I'm just curious because uh, you're talking about um, generative question answering models, but then you mostly focused on on multiple choice questions. Wouldn't uh, a discriminative approach, like a multi-class classification to say which of the, the answers is correct, would be more suitable for that particular kind of, of question answer, uh, of questions, let's say? Like, yeah, or did I miss good. something? No, no, that's a, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I would say that, um, and for a long time, I also struggled with that. Why am I st studying this? Because I was challenged by my advisors to, to pick this topic. And I was like, Isn't, aren't discriminative models enough? Um, but I guess they, they, the st they I, I guess because of the flexibility that generative uh, models, these autoregressive models, 
allow you to and to use information about the different uh, question answering systems and you don't have to fine tune your models or to have multiple models to be able to address these different uh, types of question answering that can appear for example in a you can think of for example in a chatbot application you could have different types of question being asked so these models end up being somewhat um, flexible and adapt to this setting so i guess this is the main uh motivation behind this and i one of the things i've been i've seen is that ideally we would like to have abstractive research on abstractive i was hoping that someone would have done it but i think the main drawback there or the main step back is the fact that we don't have good enough metrics for generative uh, and in data sets as well mm -hmm. um, for generative or for abstractive sorry for abstractive and free form uh, question answering models and yeah, that's an unfortunate of my of, of my talk because I know I, I try to pitch the generative question answering and then all the results are in multiple choice or extractive settings, but this is what I've seen consistently throughout yeah. the literature. So far. maybe during your PhD you can take uh, some steps in that direction. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for the very last question. Simon Novais had another question to ask, so please, Simon. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, just when when Joan Gant uh, talked about the DMC methods, uh, it reminded re reminded me of something. Um, I don't know if anyone has any input on this. I just find it very interesting how, you know, in MC dropouts, um, for example, for regression problems, we also do you know several forward passes. You know, because dropout is active during inference, it will generate several outputs. And to get a sense of the entropy of the model, we take the variance of the forward passes. But on classification models, um, we also do several forward passes, but instead of taking like the variance of, of, of the all the vectors we forward pass uh, resulted from each forward pass, we actually we average them and then look at the entropy of the final vector. Um, I just find it. I always found it an interesting way to to look to to compare the two different ways we 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 try to take the uncertainty from from the model in regression versus classification. And I guess my question is if anyone has seen or, or, or read um, other ways. Uh, uh, in which we can like uh, use MC dropouts uh, to take um, uh, uncertainty in some other ways. Um, uh, it's an open question. Uh, not sure what to expect, but uh, yeah. I, I've used it before, and I I've used it with variance and entropy. Those are the two most common. Uh, uh, yeah. metrics used and uh, the creator of Montcal dropout Yarin Gal has uh, yeah. other papers on that and he mostly goes with variants yeah yeah um yeah okay <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay thank you all for for this very nice discussion and for your presence and a very special thanks to, to Katrina who made an excellent talk and very early in the morning for her so um, a bigger thanks in even because of that and thank you all for being here once again i hope to see you all in two weeks we are going to announce the next speaker soon so yeah have a nice afternoon and see you in two weeks for another session of the pre and machine learning lunch seminars thank you